Yeah, it was it was great. I mean, it was super exciting. You know, leading up to it, though, I mean, we had been working with Launch Boom. We had learned a lot about sort of the pre-campaign importance. Uh, we were surprised at how well our pre-campaign had done. I mean, by the time we had launched, we already had over 1,900 people who had pledged a dollar to lock in the lowest price. So when we did the math, like we kind of were pretty confident we were going to have a day that was in the range of $30,000 to $40,000. So to do it to double that and do an $80,000 day, like Jeff said, was was pretty wild. We were not really expecting for it to be that that resonant. Hey everyone, welcome to the Masters Crowdfunding Podcast. Today we have the great pleasure of having Jeff and Trapper. They are the co-founders of Mahdi Boxy, which recently just uh, closed out their Kickstarter campaign at over $410,000 in pre-order revenue. Uh, what's very interesting about Trapper and Jeff's project is they are 3D files. So I'd love for one of you guys to talk a little bit more about what the offering, what the product is, and the reasons why uh, people are purchasing the product from you guys. Yeah, thanks, Kevin. Um, yeah, I mean, we, we created Mahdi Boxy uh, as a series of 3D files for a printable gamer storage system. So it is a series of boxes and fasteners and inserts uh, that allow you to really imagine, design, print out on your 3D printer, and then assemble all sorts of ways that you can store miniatures, tabletop, board games, materials, paints, brushes, Right. Anything that you really use for for board games and uh, and tabletop gaming, uh, and and the system uh, was invented by by Jeff, who spent a lot of time in <laughs> CAD designing out oh. all the files um, and putting everything together, uh, and then prototyping the heck out of it, uh, and and then decided you know to do a campaign and and bring it out into the world, uh, and it's it's definitely interesting in that there's there's very few systems where you can start with something really small you can get a lot of value by printing one single box for some gaming pieces and then as your collection grows and as your needs grow you can just keep printing more and more and assembling more and more systems so it's a it's a very expandable product and it's been a lot of fun to invent it to prototype it to work on it and now to see it out there being printed by by all the it's a little wild um one of the problems that we kept running into, because we're avid gamers and we actually collect board games and we have a ton of them. We also uh, big into like uh, war gaming, like Warhammer and that kind of stuff, is you buy one system and it works for that one thing. And you buy another system and it works for that one little thing. And you buy another system and it works for that one thing. And I get sick of buying boxes or bags or uh, foam or inserts or whatever it was. I kept buying more and more, and I got a collection of them that, for some games, I don't play anymore. And I can't do anything with what I have because it's meant for that one thing, and kind of got sick of that. It, it was just a problem that I kept mentally trying to solve and run through. Um, and when we started to work on this, like, yeah, we think we have something that's that's reusable for people that people can morph into whatever they want it to. Um, and as they grow, like Trapper said. Um, as their hobby grows, they can change whatever they had to something else and only like we made insert changes and then they have a whole new system and they put those minis away or they put those paints away for another set of paints that they have. Um, and we were trying to solve that, that, you know, how do you stop the box, 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 collecting closet kind of thing. And what's made you guys choose crowdfunding to launch the idea? Yeah, I mean, it, I think this is something that um, I mean, this was really on Jeff's radar. Um, you know, Jeff's like a, a big maker and has a basement full of tools <laughs> and 3D lathes, etching and all kinds of stuff. And, um, and, and so, you know, Jeff's really had his finger on the pulse of like what's been happening in crowdfunding. And, and there were just a number of, of these really successful STL campaigns that people were selling 3D printable STL files. Uh, and when we looked at the, the Mahdi Box system, we were like, wow, this... There's nothing out there right now that's super expandable. Um, there's a lot of systems that you you print something really large and you put it together and you have a single thing. Uh, but with Mighty Boxy, we really saw this this opportunity to build something that just could be 
configurable and expandable and and you could just always be printing with it right you you can never run out of opportunities to print more storage with the system uh, and so looking at the what had happened in the crowdfunding with other popular stl campaigns uh, we figured well if those campaigns did well you know, this system feels even more applicable to a wider audience of 3d printers uh, and so figured we'd give it a shot and and try and put together a campaign and see what happens mm -hmm. So you guys uh, ended up raising $82,000 in the first day, and then the campaign ended up at $410,000 with almost 7,000 new customers, which is a lot. I mean, Trapper, you and I, before uh, uh, we went live, you were talking about all the customer service that was happening with the 7,000 customers that you guys have, right? I mean, that's an incredible feat. Um, how did it feel? when you guys launched? Oh, day one was pretty nuts. Uh, we both took the day off of work. We actually have day jobs. So um, we took the day off of work for our launch day. And uh, the first hour we were just like, what? Like we're shaking our heads. Like this is crazy. We were, we were shocked that we got that many people coming in. Um, and by the end of the day, we were kind of exhausted, but also incredibly excited that we were at that point. Um, we didn't think that was gonna be our day one numbers at all. Uh, we were not predicting that. Um, yeah, I, yeah, it was it was great. I mean, it was super exciting. You know, leading up to it, though, I mean, we had been working with Launch Boom. We had learned a lot about sort of the pre-campaign importance. Uh, we were surprised at how well our pre-campaign had done. I mean, by the time we had launched, we already had over 1,900 people who had pledged a dollar to lock in the lowest price. So when we did the math, like we kind of we're pretty confident we were going to have a day that was in the range of thirty thousand to forty thousand dollars. So to do it to double that and do an eighty thousand dollar day, like Jeff said, was was pretty wild. We were not really expecting for it to be that that resonant. Um, and yeah, it's been the whole campaign has been exciting, and and it's it's been really great to see all of the support and and the and the the passion of the backers. Our our VIP Facebook group was just full of activity. Our Discord server has just been so much fun uh, to see people just excited and sh printing stuff and sharing things and um, and I and I think we are actually the largest STL campaign by backers. There have been other STL campaigns that have raised more money than us because they had more expensive products, um, but I think you know we're definitely the, the the largest campaign by pure number of backers by close to seven thousand people. So. We did not expect that when we set out to do this, but it does. It did sort of hit home what we originally thought was we felt like we had a really good thing that was super compelling and expandable and applicable to a wide range of people. And we, we still really believe that anybody that buys a 3D printer should check out Modi Boxy because you can print the smallest box in an hour and get value out of that and like share that with your friends, right? Uh, and And so that's sort of going forward now. You know, we're just really excited to continue to to build Modi Boxy and continue to expand the system and and continue to get in front of more people with with three D printers and 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 give them Modi Boxy as an option to print something cool. Yeah, I mean, what you mentioned there, it's like people underestimate the exponential growth that could happen on a platform, right? Not just Kickstarter, but any platform. It's like once you have a strong enough launch and you get ranked on any platform. The amount of organic exposure is, I mean, it could, it's like the difference could be an additional, I don't know, 50 or a hundred backers, but that could get you ranked significantly higher in front of, I don't know, five times more people as a result. Right. So yeah, I feel like the human mind has a hard time grasping like the exponential uh, factors. And uh, I think that's exactly what happened uh, to your campaign because of the product market fits. Yeah, the day one, um, because we did such great numbers on day one, we were definitely on the Kickstarter homepage, like growing or or coming coming in hot. I forget what the actual category is on that. Um, but we were there for a really long time, like for the first like 15, 20 days. We're only running a 30-day campaign, but because our numbers just keep growing and that organic growth around that first day uh, um, initial uh, pledge stuff. It, it was just great. Like we we really did get that growth that you that everyone talks about from that first day jump. That's amazing. And what um, if you were to you know give advice to yourself 
you know, before maybe two months before the launch of the campaign, what would that advice be? I'll let you take that. Really Jeff, curious. For, yeah, I'm really curious what your answer is, Jeff. I mean, so but Jeff, I mean, like I'm the biz, I'm the business guy. Jeff's created the whole system, right? And and you in in and, and and it's like there's 600 STL files, right? Like there's a lot of work that went into this. There's the videos, the photos. It's it's a lot more work than people think. Like it is. And it is a lot more work than we both thought when we got into it. Like there's a certain mentality you have where you're like, oh, well, we created the files. They all work, right? This is going to, we just got to like launch on Kickstarter. Um, but I think what you learn going through Launch Boom is that there is a ridiculous amount of work that you have to do to put a campaign together that can be this successful. And, and we didn't know that going in and 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 we learned that kind of as we were going through through the process. Um, so I, I think, you know, a lot of the advice that I would give to myself and that I give to anybody that is sort of interested in how this how we did it is it's it's like it's just gonna take a lot more work than you think. And you have to learn a lot of stuff that you don't know, right? You have to learn Facebook ads and metrics and all of the different ins and outs of the authoring of the page and the funnels and you know and then the email drip campaigns and the messaging cadence and there's just so much stuff that it takes to to do it it's hilarious because people on our ads would comment like well why are you crowdfunding an stl campaign the work's already done and it's just like because it's like so much work to productize something it's one thing to have a collection of files but it needs instructions it needs demonstrations it needs licenses it needs patent applications and copyrights and trademarks and an llc and bank accounts it's like there's just so much stuff that you have to put together and um and you always think you know going in but it ends up being way more work uh than you than you possibly think but that's from the business perspective like jeff's on, on the creative side jeff i'm yeah. curious what your thoughts yeah. are on so, what you got into when you decided to to, to, to <laughs> rope me into this. Um, yeah. The one thing, um, the advice I gave myself and I'll, it's, so you said, what advice would you give yourself that you didn't have? The advice I had for myself going into this whole project is one that I wish I did more of. And I'll just say it that way. It's probably a better way of wording it. And that is, you don't know everything. You can't know everything. Bring in people who know things to help you. Um, I, I, I'm a creator. I, I can do design. Um, uh, that's my background, a background graphic design. Uh, I love 3d printing. My, my, my passion is, uh, usability design and UX. So that side of it, I knew I could handle. I'm not great at business. The first person I thought of was bringing in Trapper. He's amazing at business. He's, he's done startups. Uh, he's uh, phenomenal at that stuff. He's like, Hey Jeff, you need to do all of these things. I'm like, cool, you do it. Um, I'll help you. Right. Let's go there. And then like bring them like, okay, who do we partner with and who do we bring on board to help us get this? We don't know Kickstarter. We've never, I've, I've funded a ton. I, I followed the market. We knew that we wanted to do crowdfunding, but like, we don't know enough to, to, to go to launch with that. So find people to partner with. And that, that's why we, we, um, we partner with people. Like if you don't know it, find someone to partner with or figure out how you can get the information. Cause you can't know everything and you can't do everything. Partner with the right people. Uh, that's crucial for every any kind of success. And I'd yeah. say, I don't think we did that enough. Um, I wish I had someone to help me with photography and videography. I know I did a ton of it, but I, I couldn't focus on like more files or, you know, the right stuff all the time. So you have to always buy your time of where do you actually put your stuff. So if we had a little more partnerships, me, a couple more people, it would have been easier. But on the same note, it was fun doing it all. So that's that balance, but definitely bringing people to help. And you never know it's going to be successful either, right? So you're sort yeah. of like walking this risk line between like, do I spend lots of money if you don't know you're actually going to get it back from from the crowdfunding? And so along the way, you get signals and you get a little more confident, but you know you can't just go out and spend a bunch of money and expect you're going to have a hit campaign. So you're always sort of balancing... You know, what do what can I do with sweat equity? Who can I partner with and bring in? Um, right, that's why we brought in Launch Boom is because we knew we needed somebody to help guide the pre-campaign process. I mean, to be honest, I was super skeptical of the pre-campaign process. I was like, who's going to pay a dollar for a product that has no price and is no ship date, not even a crowdfunding date? 
right? I just was not expecting anybody to do that. And the fact that like all 2000 people did that for our campaign, like before they even knew when we were launching to me was the number one learning of all of it was just like, you can't possibly expect what's going to happen. You sometimes you just have to follow what's going to happen and you just have to like see where it ends up. So you guys mentioned you guys are still working some day jobs, right? What are what are your day jobs? Like who is Trapper and Jeff outside of the cre- being the creators of Mighty Boxy? And Jeff, you were already kind of building on your UX experience there a little bit. Yeah, so um, at the moment uh, I work for Microsoft um, as a director of UX for healthcare. Uh, so uh, Microsoft's big in the healthcare space and we have a lot of tools to help um, different hospitals. Uh, uh-huh. And I, um, I make sure those work well, this best way to describe it. Nice. And I, uh, I'm a co-founder of a, a video game backend server startup called Beamable. Uh, I'm the COO there uh, and work with game devs. You know, I got my game developer conference shirt on. I was just in San Francisco at the game developers conference this year. But uh, yeah, help, help game developers implement backend technologies for their, their games and their game projects uh, prior to that. I was chief product officer at a game studio called Disruptor Beam, where I was the game director on a game called Star Trek Timelines, uh, where you just help run the game and um, build the build the commerce strategies around the games. Um, prior to that, I was the CEO of a startup I co-founded called Me you Health, which was like a gamified wellness program for health plans. Uh, and then prior to that, had co-founded a gaming community called Gamer DNA. And then prior to that. I co-founded a gaming community that was based on Microsoft's Xbox console. So I've been in the gaming space and the healthcare space, but kind of the last almost 20 years of my life has just been founding companies and building companies. And so, yeah, natural fit when Jeff was like, and Jeff and I know each other because we, um, we have, we run in the same circles of friends. We've like ridden bikes together. Like, yeah, so we've known each other a long time. And, and he was like, Hey, do you want to come do this crazy thing? And I was like, sure, I like doing crazy things. So uh, yeah, then the then the rest was history. Well, so then I guess you're very used to um, running into situations where you run into a lot of things where you don't know that you don't know until you start doing it, right? Having been co-founder of you know multiple businesses before. Um, so what uh, is the vision that you have for Mighty Boxy? I mean, what got you, Trapper, specifically you interested in working with Jeff to commercialize this? Yeah, so I've, I mean, I've always wanted to do a Kickstarter as an entrepreneur. Like the whole concept of crowdfunding to me is just fantastic. I mean, when Kickstarter was invented, um, I I backed a whole bunch of things really early on and have just always really enjoyed the crowdfunding slash patreon kind of model um so i've always had in the back of my mind like oh my god it'd be so great to do a kickstarter um but you know i've never come up with the idea to do one that was compelling enough so when jeff showed me the system one day he's like hey you know i think jeff i think you had said something like hey you need to come over i want to show you something and and then like for some reason and then for some reason it just like i never was able to come over so there was like weeks and weeks where it was just like Oh, I need to go over to Jeff's. I need to go over to Jeff's. And finally, you know, I go over there and he's like, Hey, I've invented this system. You know, I've been working on it for a couple of months. I think it could be pretty cool. Like, you know, let me show it to you. What do you think? And, and he showed it to me. And, and by this point, I mean, you'd been, you started working on it in like, I don't know, February or something like that. And then, or March. And then March, yeah. You started talking to me in August. But by then, his whole living room was just <laughs> covered. <laughs> covered in plastic like boxes and arms and it had gone through multiple iterations like so yeah it, it, it just there was just so much it was so overwhelming I was like oh my god this is just crazy so you know and and then I thought about it and I was like and I knew it was going to be a lot of work so then there was a part of me it's like wow I'm super busy already do I really want to take this on because if I do take it on right we got to knock it out of the park like we got to really throw everything into this so it took me a an, uh, probably two months, like ish, no, a month, like August to September. Month. And then so you about, about a month. Yeah. And then I came back and I, I just remember talking to my wife about it. And I was like, you know what, if, if I don't do this, I'm going to regret it. Cause this thing is going to be huge. Like, it's just going to be huge. And if I don't do it right, Jeff's going to do it with somebody else. And then it's going to be awesome. And then I'm going to be like, 
man, I should have done it. So I was like, we're doing this. And yeah. And then we just got into it and it was, it was every day was, every day was fun. I mean, I can't say there was a single day where it wasn't fun to just dive into it, to learn everything that you didn't know and to just try and figure it out. It was, it was a blast. But I don't Jeff, like, talk about how you got started. Like, how did you think this up? And like, what was the story behind what kind of got you going on it? So what, what got me going was uh, the need of storing stuff. So I was actually working on a prototype for something very different. Um, and which was for a bunch of my, my geek friends. And part of that was like these dice towers that like for rolling dice was part of it. And I, I really wanted to have this way of being able to take them apart and put them back together. So it was easy to like, simply um, make a very module system. Um, and with that, I started playing with this design and like, no, this could be storage. It's not just for dice. It's not just storing dice. It could be bigger, it could be smaller. Can we make this work better? And I just kept evolving it to the point where I like painting minis and I, I like wargaming. I made a system that held all my minis, held all my paints, held all my brushes, had everything together. And I collapsed it all down and went, put it back in the basement. And then it brought it back up and put it out of my living room and started painting up there. And it was like, wait, this is pretty cool. This is a lot faster than any tackle box or anything else I've seen. And it's, it's actually module. So I can like, oh, I can take this apart and take this to my friend's house to play and then put it back together. And then I'm, I have my paints with me. And at that point, I'm like, yeah, this needs to become something. Um, and then I went, hey, hey, they kept poking at Trapper um, and tried to leave him alone to decide, but I kept like poking him a little bit. Like, hey, do I do this? Uh, he probably doesn't remember how much I poked him. Um, but, uh, and, you know, when he said yes, we were like, yeah, let's do this. So it solved my need. And then I realized there was, I knew there was many people out there who had the same need. What are the next steps for Mighty Boxy? Like, are you guys going to make more modules? Um, uh, what What is the brand turning into? What is your vision for it? Yeah, so I mean, we're we just we're forty eight hours into releasing the files to to our backers, so that's been super fun. People are already designing and making amazing things that you know you can't even conceive of, um, you know, because we're so heads down testing and prototyping everything, and then. You give them to people with very fresh perspectives, and it's just amazing what what people can create. So, so that's just super fun, and and that's going to be the next couple of weeks is just really supporting our community. Um, we also sold over three hundred and fifty commercial licenses of Modi Boxy, so now we have this really large national global network of resellers that are going to be printing and selling Modi Boxy online and in gaming stores. And so, you know, we have to support them. Um, we had to build media kits, a commercial license, commercial IDs, QR codes. Like uh, there's a whole bunch of stuff there that we had to learn around, like how do you support and build out a commercial reselling program? So that's going to be something we are launching over the next couple of months with those folks. Um, and then we we have a bunch of stretch goals for our campaign that we didn't finish, that we that we didn't make. And they were pretty ambitious stretch goals. So you know, we we made them ambitious because they're pretty big projects, but one of them is adding an XXL option. So we have these three sizes, small, medium, and large, and a bunch of our community wanted us to make something that could be printed on 300 millimeter or larger kind of print beds. So, um, so Jeff's hard at work kind of designing not just the box itself, but all of the trays and inserts that have to go into the XXL as well as the composite version of it. So you can print the XXL on smaller bed sizes. Um, and so we plan to release that as an expansion in the coming months. And then there's two other ideas we have for like massive expansions that could be other Kickstarters. It's a little daunting to sit here today and to, and to, and to say that we're ready to do another Kickstarter because it was so much work. Um, but eventually, right. I think, you know, we can get, we can get back to that. Um, and, and so that, that would be kind of larger down the line, but, um, but definitely, you know, we're going to be doing partnerships with my mini factory for the files. We're going to be launching a Shopify site. We're going to be, you know, continuing to deliver new products and expansions. Um, so yeah, I mean, crowdfunding is never the end, you know, especially for a successful crowdfund, it's always the beginning. So, you know, now it's a matter of building Modi Boxy. Um, uh, Jeff, I don't know, what do you, what's, what's your vision for, for where we're going to go next without giving away spoilers? Yeah, we can't give away spoilers. Um, but one thing I think is the, the two things that are probably the most requested thing on our Kickstarter, on our, our, our Discord is um, uh, Modi Boxy on the moon for some reason. I don't know why. 
So I think uh, if we don't do that, some of our, our backers are going to be very disappointed. Uh, and then uh, Banana for Scale is a big one. Um, we've got to give a show up Banana for Scale. They want that badly. Um, no, I'll, I'll do it. Yeah, there's the two big ones. Uh, all joking aside, um, it's it's really expanding out the system for me. Um, can we make can we come up with other ideas? We have some. We know that, that we have some in our backlog. Um, I think blurry in the background. You might see someone deliberately blurry of things that we're, we're planning on to to throw into the system. Um, but again, for the next month or two, I want to make sure everything is working well for our backers. Like that to me, that that that's the biggest focus. Um, I want to make sure everyone's happy, everyone can print, everyone can work well with what we have now before we start introducing more parts. Um, and then, you know, we're listening to our backers um, and, and listening to our, the people that are, have, have purchased us so far. What do you guys want? Let's see if we can make it. You know, if, if gravity allows for it, I want to make it for you. That That's my model. Like, we've had some people ask for it and I'm like, I can't defy gravity. I'm sorry. Like, the physics don't allow for that. We've had a couple of those. Like, I've actually thought there's a couple that I actually was like, that's a really good idea. I, I, no, physics doesn't allow for that to occur. And I've tried like six ways to Sunday to come up with a way to do it. I can't like, they, sorry. And I felt bad because it's such a good idea. Um, but uh, as long as it's, it's possible, I love building, I love designing. So like, I, I just want to pump out more into the system. And there's lots of things around the edges too, right? Like people are wanting like a drag and drop 3d configurable software product to be able to design on the fly. Like, there's lots of secondary things that we need to investigate as far as like how we support the community. I mean, one of the things we did is a, I mean, pretty exhaustive, like I've never seen an STL project that has an instruction manual that goes as deep as ours does, but it's, it's like 80 pages. It has example build, it has parts lists. It had, I mean, the system itself is fairly complex it's because it's like 600 STL files that you can put together in a lot of different ways across three different sizes and all of these different configurations. So just trying to explain to people all of the ways that you can use this is has been, has been a significant challenge. And even today, I mean, we could probably spend the next few months just doing YouTube videos and adding to instructions and doing more diagrams and just really helping people understand the ways at which they can put these things together. So there's just a lot of content creation that that you don't realize um, goes into a lot of this. And, and that's going to be keeping us busy too for the next couple of months. Well, that's really awesome because that content could be for your existing community, but it could also expose your products to new communities as well. And I feel like that's one of the most fun parts too, supporting the community, working with them, to see all the crazy stuff that they do with your idea and your products. And then uh, Trapper, like what you were saying, all the, you know, edge things that you can potentially explore, that could be like a totally new business within your existing business too, right? Like the software, uh, drag and drop software that you were talking about. Yeah, there's a lot of places that that we can take it. And, and like Jeff said, a lot of it's going to be led by our community and kind of what they want to do. And, 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 and again, the, the reseller thing too, it's like once people start doing that, there's going to be all kinds of feedback coming back on, on what they need, what they need for their customers. Um, so yeah, there's just, there's a lot of content to do, uh, and a lot of listening to do and a lot of learning to do now that this stuff's out in the world. Yeah, that's fantastic. I mean, I feel like a lot of product creators, they're one of the biggest mistakes that I see people make is they build, 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 right? They keep building until not just like Jeff's house is filled with plastic, <laughs> but like all their houses are, you know, like the street is filled with plastic and they never get it in front of their customers or at least not early enough. Right. Yeah. Uh, how, how did you think about it, Jeff, when you were, I mean, cause you're a builder, like you said. Yeah. Uh, but it seems like you have a pretty fine balance, at least, uh, from what I can see of like, okay, I understand I need to build and I need to create a great product, but I also need to get in front of customers. And it's always that balance that makes a business or else it's just a hobby. It's not a business. Right. So my background is UX. I'm an inventor and I do usability. So when it, um, when it comes to like, user research, uh, I love user research. I, I won't go and do much without it. To me, it's, it's, it's get in front of the customers, show stuff early, get ideas. Um, I'm still used to doing paper prototypes for people from like my old UX days where you do it on walls and like now it's all digital. But like to me, it's get in front of the customer, get feedback early, show it, try it, see if it works. Um, 
And I took kind of the same approach here. I actually had, after I used it, I gave it to some friends who are avid painters that one goes between um, Massachusetts and New Hampshire almost like every other week for weekend ski trips. And she paints when she goes up to New Hampshire when she's not skiing. And I'm like, here's a box, put all your paints in it, go. And she came back and gave me tons of feedback. And I took that feedback and revamped stuff. We took tons of feedback from our Facebook group like that. They gave it ton of stuff when I mean, she would show an idea and they, they would say, oh, how about this and this? And we, they just fed us some really good ideas, always to improve it. You have to listen to your audience. Um, that's ingrained in me as a UX person. Like it's so like, it, like in my DNA and the beauty of being someone who can invent it, it was that combination of, okay, I can invent it as long as gravity lets me and you can 3D print it. Um, great. So it was always turning in the back of my head. How do I do that thing that they're asking for? Can I do it? Is it possible? Does it meet our criteria? Does it work in our system? And sometimes you get things that you invent. You're like, this doesn't work with the system. I'm going to park it for later. And you have to do that sometimes. It, it's called kill your darlings because you love it, but you just like, uh, eh, it doesn't fit for this. Maybe next one. Um, but there's also stuff you do like, oh, wow, that really does work. Let's put it in the system. Let's go. It's also interesting too, like Jeff's talking about the system. I mean, there are some pretty big constraints that we put on ourselves related to to inventing this, right? So we wanted something that was fully 3D printable. Like every piece of it is 3D printable. There's no secondary fasteners. Um, it's like the bolt system was uniquely designed to be a 3D printable bolt that doesn't come unscrewed when you twist it. So it has to have a locking pin like, and there's no glue, right? And everything's printable with no supports. So these are challenges to overcome for sure from a design perspective in order to adhere to that. So not requiring separate tools or equipment, not requiring glue, not requiring supports. For anybody that does 3D printing, like they're often really shocked that that was accomplished because almost everybody expects to print with supports and and you don't, not for a single piece of the entire system. In fact, if you do, you might mess stuff up. So so it's it's been fun to see the community like get these files and just be like, oh my God, like this is crazy. Like I can literally print everything with no supports, no glue, no no extra assembly. Everything just works right off the bed. Um, and that was that was, those were the three tenets of the system. Uh, and so to 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 actually pull that off um, and to see that actually working is really awesome. Because there's a lot of other things you could do. There's a lot of other ways you could build this if you are going to use those things. But our challenge to ourselves was really like this thing needs to be fully 3D printable um, for everything. And and I think we achieved that. And that's that's been really fun to see the community react to that. Yeah. And I, I think what Jeff, like you mentioned earlier... Um, you guys ranked for like two weeks out of the you know, four that you guys were live on Kickstarter, right? And I think the fact that you guys got the product in your background in as a UX researcher and getting the product in front of people and find that product market fits in advance, that continue to stick, right? And that's what got organic people visiting the, the site to want to back your campaign, including the constraints that uh, Trapper, you talked about, and then because those people are visiting, well, now, and, and buying after they see your product, now Kickstarter is very incentivized to keep your campaign on the front page because they ultimately get 5% of whatever you guys raise, right? So they want to send yeah. traffic to campaigns that convert, that have product market fit. So, yeah, it's like that continuous exponential factor that builds on top of uh, itself. And so what would your advice, Jeff, be to someone that's like, hey, I actually don't want to share this product with anyone. You know, I'm scared that they'll steal the idea or I need to finish this. I need to perfect this before I show it to anyone and get it in front of customers. Because that's the opposite of what you did. Yeah. In terms yeah. of making like paper prototypes. <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Oh, that's what early days. Yeah. This one didn't have paper prototypes. But um, I, I, I get the idea that someone can steal your idea. Like, I get that. It's always a fearful thing. Um, and, and with any product launch, I've done a bunch myself um, in different formats. But you can't design in a bubble. And if you're designing in a bubble, you're designing for yourself. That means you'll buy it. How many of you are out there? And, and that's what you have to ask yourself. And if you think there's a thousand of you out there that will pay the money and that's what you need, okay, try. 
but you know, there's ways around getting people to look at your stuff, like NDAs or get people to sign stuff. Uh, if you have to do focus groups, there's ways of doing that where people won't say stuff. Um, you know, I knew my friends wouldn't say anything. And I asked them not to take it to, to game stores until we were at a point where it made sense. And that's why I gave to friends, like, use it at home, use it when you're traveling, but don't bring it to a game. So don't show it off yet. We're not there yet. We're still refining stuff. So there's ways of limiting that kind of thing. Um, friends and family aren't going to squeal. If they do, they weren't good friends and family. So at least start there, right? Um, if they're not your audience, find people that are your audience that you can trust. And if you don't have that, you know, you have to get out of there. You have to start showing it to people. Um, you know, and if your idea, if, if your idea is so simple that someone can come in faster than you, then your idea, someone else is going to do it anyway. Yeah. You know, I mean, the ideas are, ideas are, are, are free, right? Like I think at the end of the day, what, what I learned the most about this campaign is that the product is one thing, but the strategy, right. And the process and the discipline is, is almost more important that you have to, you have to have a great product and Jeff's a genius and takes great photos and shoots great video. And so therefore it's like very easy to like the product. Um, but you also just have to do the work. Like you have to run the ads, you have to do the tests, you have to iterate, you have to get feedback, you have to show that you're engaged, you have to listen to ideas, you have to interact with your community, you have to execute across all these different vectors. Uh, and that's really what builds the, the, the builds the brand, right? Um, and then the brand propels the product. So the, building the Mati Boxy brand and seeing that people really start to resonate with with not the product, but like what we're actually making and how we're actually making it and how we're involving them in the process. Um, that's the, the most fun part of this. The community is the most, the most fun part. And the community just feeds off of, off of us. So if we're open and creative and, you know, engaging with them, then they're going to do the same back to us. Right. And, and then it becomes like this great feedback loop where we're all just making stuff. We're all just a bunch of people, 3d printing, figuring it out and having fun designing it and making things. So the, the, the community is really, really the best part. And, um, and, and that's really going to be the most fun over the next couple of months anyway, is just really seeing everything that everyone prints and, and, and really just enjoying it, getting out into the world. So I guess my takeaway from what you both said is like, Hey, get the product out there and, but do your best to protect yourself, right? Like don't show yeah. it to game stores, et cetera. And you have to build with your customers or with the users, or else um, you're just building for yourself, which is very, very tough to scale that pass yourself. Yeah, and 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 I, I don't know so much about like even the protection side of it. It's like, if you look at what Jeff created, like it's freaking hard. <laughs> like like <laughs> it, is, it is hard. Like nobody's gonna just stumble into that. Like you gotta go on a mission, like a multi-month mission to really understand what's going on there and, and to really invent something like that that builds a system like this so it's you know i i think that we were fine showing it to friends doing giant like we did that one night at your house with all those people yeah, came over and testing yeah and we just like because you had so much extra stuff it was like okay how can we clean all this stuff out of your living room <laughs> let's just have like 10 people over and let's just have them make whatever they want and take it home with them and then the living room's going to get emptied out right and <laughs> it didn't work, by the way. That that did not work. Yeah. <laughs> we still had a yeah, living room full of it. Well, and then what was funny was like literally the next day I was like, hey, Jeff, can you shoot a shoot a photo of this box in this format? And you're like, oh, no, someone took that home last night. Like, now I got to go print another one of those. To that point, though, like that usability testing that we did with a group of people in, in house, they were actually all at my house with a bunch of tables set up and like two or three ideas came out of that. I watched them struggle on things. Like I, I observed people struggling. Like I can't make this work. Why? And we had to show them. So that influenced the instruction manual that influenced, it gave me two new uh, products. That's where the latch lid came from, which is everyone loves that latch lid thing. I actually love it. It's one of my, best, my favorite parts of the system. Um, and if it wasn't for like getting people's input, trying it, you don't observe those things that people are struggling with or the things that they like and don't change. So you have to do your testing. You have to get in front of audience. You have to watch them. You have to observe. You have to get do that work. 
it, it, that's just it's, it's ingrained in my head. I'm going to keep butchering that, but it's so true because if you don't get it, you won't nail your product right for your customer. Yeah, that's so good. So I want to switch gears a little bit here to you guys personally. So you guys have day jobs. You're working your butts off on this, especially you know this week, right? 48 hours ago, you sent out the files. You know, Trapper was saying 30 messages in Discord every time he signs on. Um, you have families. Like, what are your what do your days look like? Is there something that you guys do on a consistent basis, like a routine or, or workout, whatever it is, that keeps you going? I mean, especially for yourself, Trapper, you've been a founder for so many years. It's it's a roller coaster, right? <laughs> lots of highs and lots of lows. So, like, how do you, is there something that you hold on to on, on a day-to-day or week-by-week basis that keeps you consistent? Hey, for me personally, um, you know, I guess if you do startups, and you are a serial entrepreneur, um, just dealing with stress is part of the job and it becomes a skill that you get good at. You just get good at being stressed out um, and you get good at mitigating it. Like you just get good at philosophically handling the stress of the situations and understanding what you can control and what you can't and how you react and really just sort of like living in that in that world. Um, because entrepreneurism is, is in itself, the definition of it is this idea of ambition greater than resources controlled. So you have this ambition to go out and achieve these things, but you don't have the resources to do it, either the resources in money, knowledge, or time. So you just have to figure it out. You have to figure out your, your way there. Um, so for me, you know, I have, I have a, a, an amazing supportive family and kids. I have a bunch of amazing friends, um, but you know, I am someone. I love cues. Like I, I, I love inbox zero. I love, you know, uh, I love the pips, the red pips on my phone that I have to close out. So like having thirty messages in Discord to me is not a problem. It's it's a it's another queue that I get to empty, and I am very satisfied by emptying queues. So I really don't have too much of a problem with it. Uh, I like doing the work. So, yeah. Does it mean that, you know, I don't get to go to bed as early as I did a couple weeks ago? Sure. But it's only, it's only going to be for a limited time, right? This is the big surge, 7,000 people, you know, and it's kind of the fun part, right? It's much better to be overwhelmed because your product has been so successful than to be going to bed early every night because like nobody cares. So I'd much rather take this at the end of the day. Um, but yeah, I mean, my routine is I love cues. I can handle stress. You know, it, this is the ride. This is the fun part. So just try and try and lean into it and enjoy it, and uh, and trying to see where it's going to take us. Yeah, daily routine. Um, well, I woke up really early and walked my dog. That's a daily routine. Um, it's um, the big thing for me. It, it's knowing when to separate the two, like your work life balance and your hobby life balance. Like, um, and if you don't, you're going to just drive yourself crazy. Um, and don't try to let them interfere with each other. That that's kind of the way I, you know, work with this. Um, so, you know, um, you kind of have to shut down like certain areas and it's hard. Like, like these last couple of days are hard for me to shut down because I want to help people and get them in. And like, so those days are the days like maybe you're multitasking a little too much at work. Like, okay, I'll answer that one discord thing. Okay, fine. Go back to work and do that. Um, I don't like doing that if I don't have to, but because of the, the timing of this, it makes sense. Um, but other than that, it's, you know, you have to be disciplined. It's, it's a discipline. Um, and if you're not, you can just drive yourself crazy because you're, you're, you're smashing too many different things together. Uh, and if you don't separate yourself from, from different parts, you're not being creative. You need time to digest things. So actually getting away can make it better for you. You're always like, oh, I need to do the next thing. I need to fix this problem. I need to do this. But then you're not really thinking creatively. And you're not really solving the problem. And sometimes it's better to background a problem that's just driving you nuts than it is to keep it in the foreground. So like my daily routine is I walk my dog in the morning. I I maybe do a little bit of, of Mighty Boxy stuff. Then I actually go to work and, and t- put Mighty Boxy aside for a little while so that I can come back with a fresh look at night and actually get to start working on that. Um, or on the weekends. Like if you separate yourself, it makes it easier to come back fresh. So that's really important. And some days, no, I didn't do that to myself, but it really hurt. And I knew I didn't do it. So like I have to always I just have to remember to take my own advice and take a step back and, and like deal with it. Um and then mitigating stress is always hard because it's stressful doing this. Like you don't know what's gonna happen, you don't know where things are gonna go sometimes. 
you think you're done, you're not. And then, you know, yeah. And you don't want to let people down, right? You don't want to let people down. That's the big thing. Like, you know, I remember talking to Jeff one because so Jeff and I would essentially meet every Sunday night at 730. So like, like I have four kids. It's a super busy weekend. Like, you know, we typically would work all week in the evenings. But then like Saturday, I was kind of out of pocket because I just had kids stuff and all day Sunday. And then so 730, I would come over to Jeff's house. We'd sit down, we'd pull out our laptops and we would like work till 11 to just plan the week and be like, OK, what do we got to do this week? What are the things we got to do? Um and there was a moment, I remember like kind of the after the Kickstarter launched and we had that amazing first day, we had taken off of work and then the second day was amazing and then the third day was amazing. And we that first Sunday, I just remember being like, holy crap, now we actually have to like deliver something. <laughs> <laughs> like there are people now, like there are lots of people, there are thousands of people who need a thing now and, and it just kept getting more and more and more. And so by the end... You know, when it, when the campaign finally ended, there's a certain amount of excitement of like, oh my God, we just did a $410,000 STL campaign. But then there's like, yeah, but there's 7,000 people that need to understand how this thing works now. And so there was very little celebration. There's been very little celebration, I think. Right, Jeff? Like, yeah, yeah. We should pretty much been more. <laughs> like, yeah, we should do more. But it's like, until people got the files, until we know that people are set, that they're productive with the files, that the files don't have bugs, it's really hard to celebrate until all those things are done. And this is where a digital campaign, like I can't imagine the crazy people that then have to go manufacture the thing and actually get it to people like that is just crazy. <laughs> We're lucky. We just have to email some files. But man, it, that's stressful enough, let alone going and actually like getting a manufacturer and having to make the thing. I do think there's a difference, though, when you look at digital files versus physical, because everyone knows it takes time to get the physical goods made. Yeah. Like, they know it's going to take several months for that to actually get to them. So you, ha I think you have a, like, I know manufacturing takes a while and it's, that's a lot, but there's, th there's nothing you can do while you're waiting for the thing to get shipped and made and, and all that stuff. Where with, with digital files, people are like, tomorrow, tomorrow, can I have it tomorrow? And like, because they think they they are done, but like the instructions aren't done, the distribution isn't ready. Like we got all as much as we could ready, but like even Kickstarter takes two weeks to get you names. Then we can't do anything until we actually get those names to us, and we got as close as we could to the date that we got those names that we possibly could. Well, because we still have to get them into like my manufacturer, they have to process them, make sure it's all working, test the system. Like that all takes time. But, you know, people, rightly so, just think, well, it's a digital file. Just send it to me. I paid. My credit card was charged. Um, and that expectation actually makes it harder for people doing digital files because they're, they, 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 the perception is they're done, just send them. And, and rightly so. Like, I, that's what I would think, too, until I, like, opened the curtain and went, oh, yeah, this is a lot here. This does take time. And some of the veterans that were, had backed a lot of other Kickstarter is like, hey, you might want to give yourself a little more time here. We've seen it. We know. We've heard other backers say it takes more time. Um, and that's one thing we did listen to from our community, definitely. It was like, okay, yeah, we need a little buffer here because um, we didn't know. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good thing to that's a good thing to raise too, just like to call out real quick, right, is, is we leaned on the existing Kickstarter STL community a lot. So the guys from Stagetop, they let us borrow the template for the commercial agreement, which was super helpful. Um, the, the guys over at gut brain. And then we worked with the team over at Omni, um, who just completed Omni three, like they were super helpful, like answered so many questions. We did a cross promo with them, which was fantastic. They sent us a lot of backers. We sent them a lot of backers. We didn't even consider doing cross promotions until they reached out and they were like, Hey, do you want to do this thing? We'll send each other traffic. And we're like, Oh, sure. And now we've had multiple calls with that team because they're just so smart. They've done this so many times. Right. They they know all of the gotchas. We were able to ask so many questions and, and learn so much. So it's really cool to see that there's like a community of 3D printing STL backers as well. And we're all kind of helping each other like be successful. Right. Because because there's plenty of a new printer. Like the market's only going to get bigger. There's only going to be more 3D printers out there. So it's been really awesome to make those connections with folks and to collaborate and to learn and um, and and those those you know both Omni and Stagetop were super helpful, just giving us little tips along the way. And yeah, it was very very good to cross paths with those folks. Yeah, I mean, talk about like getting people 
to like bring in the right partners that Jeff talked about way earlier, you know, in the, in the podcast, right. Um, helping you pointing out things that you don't know that you don't know, and then addressing those in advance. It's almost like a, I don't know, a flashlight in a dark tunnel or something. Yeah. Helps you see, okay, next week, two weeks, a month from now, what's ahead and how do we prepare for that? And I want to highlight what you said too, Jeff, like making space and, and you too, Trapper, like what you guys are really doing is compartmentalizing, right? Your job, Madi Boxy, as much as you can, obviously, like this week sounds like it's been tough, which is normal, right? Things will ebb and flow. But uh, like you guys make the space Sunday nights to do the planning. You guys are making space to um, do the creative thinking as well, right? Because it actually reminds me of um, this uh, blog post that I highly recommend everyone uh, read the, the creator schedule versus the manager squ- schedule. I, I forget exactly um, what the title is, but I'll link it on the podcast. It's uh, written by Paul Graham, the founder of Y Combinator. And it talks exactly about that, right? It's just like, okay, if you're going to make stuff, this is the type of schedule that needs to be followed so that you can have space to be creative. And um, so is there a piece of content, blog post? video, movie, book that has positively influenced you guys along the way? What do you think, Jeff? Yeah, so there's one that I can't find anymore, and I wish I could. Um, If someone could dig it up, please send it to me. Um, John Cleese did a speech at a college, and that's probably why it was taken down, about giving creative space. And it was a pretty amazing, coming from him, who's like, he's a a well-known actor, comedian, uh, part of my part of my Python. Um, he get into this whole thing of it's easy to check an email, and that's why you do it. It's hard to be creative. Um, it's very simple to go. Yeah, I'm gonna get my inbox to zero because that's a task, and tasks make you feel better, and you get that dopamine hit. Like, oh, I I did that. But to take a step back and try to be creative and stare at a wall for an hour to come up with an idea feels like you got nothing done. And to give people space to do that is hard. To feel like you have the space to do that is hard. Uh, and it, it, I, I wish I could, I'm paraphrasing, and he did such a, a he's an elegant speaker. He did much, a much better speech on this. And if I can find it, I'll try to get it to you. If someone else finds it, I would love to, to hear it. But how do you spell his last name, Jeff? Oh, I'd have, I'm not sure. Uh, he's part of the Mighty Python group. Um, and John Cleese. Yeah. Uh, I have to go look it up. I'm not great with spelling. I'll get. I'll. I'll find it. Okay, Trapper. Yeah, I mean, I I can't say that there's like a specific book um, that that jumps out, but there's kind of two two aspects to this that I always like that I always kind of center myself around. So, you know, the first is just some of like the basic tenets of like Stoic philosophy around what you can control and what you can't, and that just discerning that gives you the ability to detach yourself from the stress so it's it's very easy to find yourself in a stressful situation or something occurs and your initial reaction is like anxiety and and uncertainty and just sort of pulling yourself back from that and being like well the thing has happened can't change it now i just got to figure out the path forward and um you know there's a a instagrammy tiktoky guy ryan holiday who has a book called the obstacles the way and it's always about like if you are facing obstacles, then you're doing the right thing. Like if if you are constantly overcoming obstacles, then that's what it feels like to do new and challenging things and to learn new stuff is is to always be sort of um, you know going up against against the obstacles. So so that always kind of lingers in in my mind. And and then when it comes to business, um, I was I was lucky enough to be able to go through the Harvard um, Business School GMP program and. And I had a professor there, Linda Hill, that sort of talked about the three circles of of control um, as a manager. And the middle circle is yourself, like managing yourself. Um, the second is managing your team. And the third is managing your network. And I always think about how it's so unique to think that the very first thing that you manage is yourself. And, and, and typically, right, if you think about it, let's say you're at home and it's late. And you get an email from an angry customer and your first reaction is to be like, you forward that email to your head of customer success and you say, Hey, this customer is pissed off. Like you should really go, you should deal with this person. And it's like 9 PM at night. Right. 
So like you're doing that because you as the manager want to solve your own stress. So you're saying, so you're going to take this stress and you're going to give it to your subordinate, right? And you're going to say, you deal with this. It's 9 p.m. at night. You deal with it, right? And, and, and what you should do as a leader is that's your job to hold that stress. It's not your job to like delegate that at 9 p.m. at night to someone else. It's your job to wait till the morning and say, oh, sucks. I know about this customer. They're pissed off. This is going to be a terrible day tomorrow. But like you, no one's going to fix that right now. Like nobody's going to fix that right now. So, so learning to manage yourself, learning to manage your own reaction, right? And protect others from that, right? Is an important, important trait. Uh, and I like to think that, that Jeff and I work well together because he is the creative and he requires the creative schedule and I'm the business manager guy and I work on the business manager schedule. So, you know, so, so, so together, like we kind of cover both of the bases. Like I'm the person who's like, you, you DM me, I'm going to DM you right back. Like I am solving the cues and filling the problem. And, and Jeff needs the space to sit inside of a 3d studio and like figure out how to tweak a millimeter of a thing, right. In order to solve like this cascading design challenge. So, so you got to have sort of both of those mentalities on the team. And I think that that's why we've been able to work so well together is just fundamentally we're filling these two roles and they require kind of different skill sets. Uh, and so, you know, we're able to create the space for each other by like staying in our lanes and like doing it, doing, you know, the things that we're both, we're both really good at. Yeah. And what you said, Trapper there, like reminds me of, um, a couple of things. The, the first is, um, like taking ownership of the feelings that come up or the, the stress that come up. Um, Jocko Willink, uh, he's like a Navy SEAL, has a really great book on that called Extreme Ownership. And uh, I can't highly recommend that enough to people. I think I've read that book, actually. Yeah, I think, I, I think I've read that book. Is the, There's an anecdote in there where he talks about like, you know, you if you're in the middle of the chaos of a battlefield, you just like, you put your head up, you take a breath, you look around, you make a choice. Like you just, it's going to be chaos anyway. And you just have to like, Proceed, you know, you just have to plow through. Correct, correct. Yeah, and I can't recommend that book enough. And then to what you mentioned, like Ryan Holiday, Stoicism, etc. cetera. Uh, I love Ryan Holiday's stuff. It's great, but I feel like going directly to the source, right? Marcus, Marcus Aurelius, the emperor of Rome during his greatest time, right? During Rome. Yeah, I know. Meditations, um, you know, Epictetus, all that stuff. Yeah, no, I've read all those things for sure. It's... It's it's helpful if you're in a stressful world and you're in a stressful job, um, you know that's those are those are the tricks, right? The philosophies behind how do you deal with stress and because it's never going to go away, like it's it's always going to be there. And if you do a Kickstarter, you're going to get the same stress. <laughs> you're going to have to come up with systems to be able to handle it. Yeah, I think a lot of people, you know, look at a successful crowdfunding creator or a successful business and go, wow, that must be nice and the stress must be all gone. Actually, you just deal with bigger problems, <laughs> right? So I think these, I, I love that you shared all these things, both of you guys, Jeff and Trapper, um, to, we get to wrap this up now, but is there anything, any asks that you have of the audience that's listening right now before we wrap this up? I mean, yeah, we'd love to have you check out our stuff and, and see what we're doing. And, you know, definitely, uh, we'll be, uh, releasing a lot of new stuff and, you know, join our discord server. We'll give the link, you know, in the, in the bio, uh, and all of that. But, um, and definitely, you know, we're also open to people just reaching out about their own Kickstarters and, and, you know, if they have any questions about the journey or the partners we've worked with, um, you know, happy to offer recommendations and referrals. And um, we were the benefits of a lot of knowledge from people who have done this. Uh, and now that we've done it and, you know, luckily had some success doing it, uh, totally willing to pass along what we learned and, and, and what we did for anybody that's curious. So don't hesitate to, to reach out. Um, our contact information, right, will be available um, through through the show notes and stuff. So, yeah, love to hear from anybody. That's awesome. And what's the domain? that they could visit to learn more about Mahdi Boxy? Uh, you can go to just MahdiBoxy.com and that will take you to wherever our most recent version of the of the files are sitting. 
Uh, eventually, it'll take you to our own store, but that's still weeks away. All right. Well, very good. Anything else you want to add there, Jeff? Fun Kickstarters. They're great. <laughs> be my, my, one of my big ones. Uh, um, I know this, this is probably more geared towards people that are trying to do Kickstarters, but funding Kickstarter is awesome. I've been doing it for a very long time um, and know the struggles that people are doing. And uh, if they're doing well, let them know. Um, we had a lot of people actually tell us that during our Kickstarter, like, thank you for doing well on this. Um, and those people really help. You get some Debbie Downers and that kind of stuff, but you know, support Kickstarters. I, I, I really do mean that. Um, and they're, they're, everyone's trying to do something good. Yeah, I agree. Fun more Kickstarters, everyone. I mean, it's just you're uh, helping creators be more creative, bring more innovation to the markets. Um, even if once in a while they don't deliver, you, you're part of something great and you went on an adventure, right? So um, thanks for that, guys. Really appreciate your guys' time and like offering your time to other creators out there. I think that's invaluable. Um, to be able to like pass on that knowledge and help other creators create bigger and better things. So thanks for being on and share your knowledge and insights and your learning so far. And I'm excited to have you guys back on maybe you're after your next campaign or after you've built this to a, you know, multi-million dollar business. So thank you so much. Look forward to that. <laughs> <laughs>